Good evening, saints of the living God. We want to thank the Lord for bringing us together once more again at the feet of Jesus. We want to thank him for leading and directing us uh, as we continue with our services. Thank you so much, Elder, for encouraging the church to get involved in mission. That's the reason of our existence as a church. Now is the time for us to put our hands on the plow. Tonight, my dear brothers and sisters, we are exploring a very important topic. We're talking about the devil's strategic plan for end times. That's the title that we are going to uh, explore. <clears throat> Shall we bow heads as we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, I want to thank you once again for allowing us to sit at the feet of Jesus. We pray that you may speak to our hearts, speak to our minds, so that at the end of it all, we may declare it is good to be with Jesus. Direct our steps, direct the presentation of this message. May your name be glorified. May you increase as I decrease. This is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. The devil's strategic plan for end times. That's the title of our message tonight. My brothers and sisters, I want to remind us tonight that we are at war. We are at war, the great controversy is raging all around us and in us. Yes, it is true that Christ defeated the devil at the cross. At the cross, Christ inflicted uh, a wound on the devil's head. The devil was bruised, as it were. That was the burden of the message last night. It is true that Christ cast the devil down from heaven, he threw him down from heaven. So we are told in the book of Revelation. And we know as we speak, the devil is quarantined here on planet earth, like a diseased animal awaiting his fate. But nevertheless, the book of Revelation reminds us that the devil, is filled with rage because he knows that his time is short. And so, my brothers and sisters, we are still at war. We are still at war. And in times of war, there are certain things that we need to understand. <clears throat> the first one, in times of war, we need to know our enemy. We need to know our enemy. If we do not know our enemy, we will end up shooting our comrades in arms, directing fire towards our very own. And that will be tragic. This is what other Christians are doing as I speak, Advedis for that matter. <laughs> they direct their, uh, you know, weapons, as it were, uh, to the friendly forces, to their comrades in arms. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so they lose direction. It's important for us to know our, our enemy. And that's the reason why Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, we are not fighting against flesh and blood, but against the wicked spirits in high places, against principalities and powers in heavenly realms. So the apostle Paul wanted the church to know the real enemy. So you're not fighting against flesh and blood. Anyone who has flesh and blood is your friend, even though you may not uh, you know, read from the same page. You may not see eye to eye. 
on certain issues. But as long as they are made of flesh and blood, they are part of us. That's what the Apostle Paul says. He says we fight against principalities of darkness in high places, wicked spirits in high places. That's what we're fighting against. We're fighting against the devil and the fallen angels. And so point number two, you need to, you need to be acquainted with the schemes or the strategies of the enemy. It's important for us in a state of war to be aware of the schemes and the strategies of the enemy. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, listen to what the apostle Paul says. He says, confidently, he says, for we are not unaware of the devil's schemes. Another translation says, for we are not ignorant of his designs. We're not ignorant of his designs. In verse 10 of the same chapter, he says, we would not be outwitted by Satan. We are not outwitted by the devil. Why? Because we are not ignorant of his designs. We are not ignorant of his schemes. To the Ephesians, the Apostle Paul writes, we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the devil's craftiness in deceitful schemes. That's in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. So the apostle Paul knew about the schemes of the devil. He was not ignorant of the devil's designs. He was not. And you could confidently declare to the church that, you know, we know our enemy. Number one, we know his schemes. We know his strategies. Can we say the same as a church? Do we know our enemy? Do we know the schemes of the devil? Do we know his strategies in the end time? We are living in the end time. Do we know his strategies? If we don't know his strategies, then the battle is already over before it, 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 it finishes. Because we, we have, we just have, it's imperative. We just have to know how he operates. And this is the burden that we have, that I have tonight. That's the burden of the message. And I want to invite you to the book of Isaiah, chapter 14, verse 12 to 14. The Bible says, talking about Lucifer, the angel of light, who became the very bearer, the bearer of darkness. The Bible says, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, now take note of this. You said in your heart, I will ascend unto heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. This is what you say. In your heart, this became <clears throat> your sin. You said in your heart, you conceived the sin in your heart by saying to yourself, speaking to yourself, that you will ascend unto the heaven and exalt your throne above the stars of God, and that you will sit upon the mount of congregation. And I want you to underline that the mount of congregation. So the devil is saying, I would want to sit 
amongst the assembly, not just uh, as just one, one a, a, a part of the assembly, but I would want uh, to direct worship to myself. The word congregation points to worship, a group of people who assemble for worship. So Isaiah captures the devil's ultimate desire, his ultimate vision in the great controversy. The devil is saying, I will sit on the mount of congregation, the mount of congregation. I will sit amongst the group of worshipers, as it were. I want to be the focal center, the object of worship. And so this was the devil's heinous desire, the desire to be worshiped. His vision is to see all created beings worshiping him. He doesn't care that he is a creator. He wants all other creators, oh yeah, creatures um, uh, to, to worship him. He's a creature, but he wants all other creatures to worship him. <clears throat> the devil, my brothers and sisters, is an insatiable desire to be worshiped. That's his disease. That's his disease. It's more than an obsession. He can do anything to achieve this demonic vision. He wants to be worshiped. No wonder historians will tell us that more blood has been spilled over the issue of religion on this planet than any other cause. The pages of history of this planet are drenched in blood, spilled over the issues of worship. I think it will be good for me to share with you just a few examples from the Bible. Examples that will help us to realize the devil's level of insanity when he discovers that his vision is being challenged. In Genesis chapter four, verse eight, we are told, and Cain killed his brother Abel. The first grave on planet Earth, the first grave to be dug on planet Earth came to be over the issue of worship. And so Cain killed Abel. Brothers and sisters, when we talk about worship, we are talking about a serious thing. We are talking about something that is at the core, that is at the center of the great controversy. In Daniel chapter 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the burning furnace because they refused to bow down. They refused to worship the golden image which was dedicated to Maduk Bell. Maduk Bell um, is the devil himself, the God of ba Babylon. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into that burning fire. Were it not the intervention of God through his grace, they could have perished in the fire. They could have perished, but we thank God Great is his faithfulness. In the book of Esther, chapter 3, verse 5 to 6, we read here, when Haman saw that Mordecai could not kneel down or pay honor to him, he was enraged. He was enraged. Who was behind Haman? It was the devil himself. He is obsessed, as it were, by a desire to be worshipped. So you need to keep that in mind. And so when Haman saw that Mordecai could not kneel down because he had told them clearly, he had declared himself to be a Jew, a worshipper of Yahweh. And so Haman didn't like it. The Bible says, 
Yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Middle Persia. A date was set to destroy, to annihilate, and completely exterminate all the worshipers of Yahweh in Middle Persia. You can see how mad the devil is about this issue of worship. And again, God had to step in to protect his people and to frustrate the plans of the enemy. And we thank God for great is his faithfulness. Luke chapter four, verse five and seven. We read this last night. The devil led him, meaning Christ, up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor for it has been given to me. That's a lie. And I can give it to anyone I want. Verse six says, so if you worship me, there he comes again. It will be yours. It's all about worship. He is obsessed with this desire to be worshipped. So knowing fully well that Christ is God, the devil was not even ashamed of demanding worship from God himself. He was not even ashamed of demanding worship from Christ himself. And you ask yourself, what about human beings? How is he going to deal with human beings? Fallen beings like you and me. We read about the persecution of the Christians under the Roman emperors, such as Diloxian, Galerius, Maximan, and the emperor Nero. We hear and we read that thousands, if not millions of people were butchered in this Roman empire, the pagan Roman empire, just because they refused to worship the emperor. And that was deemed as treasonous. Who was behind this bloody persecution? It was the devil himself. Read about the Spanish Inquisition during the dark ages, the persecution of the Waldenses, the persecution of the lowlands and the Higonauts. History tells us that between 50 to 100 million people were butchered because they dared to worship God differently as directed by the scriptures. So they paid the ultimate price. They sealed their testimony with their blood. But I like how the Ellen White puts it. The blood of the Christians became the seed of the gospel. You can never stop the gospel by persecution. Brothers and sisters, I want you to note that the whole history of planet Earth is littered as it were, <clears throat> drenched as it were with blood, the blood of the saints who dared to defy the enemy of our souls around the issue of worship. Revelation chapter 13 tells us that the fires of persecution will soon be rekindled again. The fires will be rekindled. Right now we are at the very age of this stupendous crisis. My brothers and sisters, it won't be long, it won't be long. We are already there as we approach the end of this world. We are already there. We are living at a time when the devil is marshalling all his forces to achieve this end, his vision. He would want to sit amongst the congregation of the whole entire universe. Of course, that one, he failed already. He failed already. And so now he's concentrating on planet Earth, just one planet, the odd one out. 
He's marshalling all his forces to achieve this desired end. Revelation chapter 13 presents a very disturbing picture of the last days of this planet. It says here in chapter 13, verse 3, and I saw one of his heads as it had been mortally wounded. And his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. Verse 4 says, they saw they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. They worshipped the dragon. In the process of following the beast, they worshipped. They found themselves kneeling in the presence of the dragon, worshipping the dragon. And they worshipped the beast, saying, who is like the beast? Revelation chapter 13, verse 8 says, all who dwell on earth. My brothers and sisters, this is a painful reality. The Bible is saying, all who dwell on earth will worship him, will worship the dragon, whose names have not been written in the book of life, of the lamb slain from the foundation of the, of the world. All who dwell on planet earth will worship him, except those whose names are written in the book of life. I pray, my brothers and sisters, that we may be counted among the faithful. That is my prayer. But the question is, how will the devil cause all who dwell on earth to worship him? All of them, except this you know, small group of people. Because we are told in Revelation chapter 20, verse 8, that in terms of numbers, the lost are like the sand on a seashore. No wonder the Bible says, he causeth all who dwell on earth to worship him. And so prophecy, my brothers and sisters, reveals the devil's strategic plan and how it's being implemented even as I speak right now. We are living at a time when there is a great recruitment that is taking place. A great gathering process is taking place, my brothers and sisters. In Revelation chapter 16, verse 13, uh, up to 16, that's where you find the devil's strategic plan as it is. And I thank God for the word of God. I thank God more for the prophets. We have a more sure word of Bible prophets. We will do well to cling to this word because it is light unto our feet until the day dawns, until the morning star rises in our hearts, until Jesus comes, we will be directed by Bible prophecy. And I thank God for Bible prophecy. It is Bible prophecy that discloses the devil's end time strategic plan. And here is it. In Revelation chapter 16, verse 18, the Bible says, And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And I want to beckon on the church to say, by the grace of God, we need to take heed to this message. We need to understand the times that we are living in. We need to understand even the devil's strategic plan. We need to understand his maneuvers in this great controversy and especially in the final push to overthrow the kingdom of God. We, we, we need to be aware of the vials of the devil. We need to be aware of his schemes so says the Apostle Paul. We need not to be ignorant. It is possible for, for, for us to have these titles, pastors, elders, deacons, Sabbath school, superintendents, and yet we are ignorant 
of the critical issues in the great controversy, then we become a liability in the cause of God. I want us, by the grace of God, to understand this. We are living at a time when these three unclean spirits have already begun, you know, their operations. They are already operative as I speak. The first spirit comes out of the mouth of the dragon. The second one out of the mouth of the beast. The third one out of the mouth of the false prophet. Verse 14 says, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles, underline that one, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of the Lord Almighty. Verse 15 says, behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is that watchest. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they shall see his shame. Verse 16 says, and he gathered them together in a place called, in Hebrew, in Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. And so, my brothers and sisters, here we see three unclean spirits gathering people to the battle of Armageddon. We will talk about the battle of Armageddon on Sabbath. <clears throat> we will talk about that on Sabbath. But I want you to have an appreciation of the devil's strategic plan as we move towards uh, Armageddon, as we approach the battle of Armageddon. According to Revelation chapter 16, verse 14, the main agenda of these three unclean spirits is to gather. The Greek word uh, translated gather there is sunagogain. Sunagogain, to gather people to the great day of the Lord. Sunagogain is an Irish active and indicative verb, which means that the act of gathering people to the battle of Armageddon is a deliberate, well-calculated move which has been taking place over a period of time. It is consummated, it reaches its climax in <clears throat> Revelation chapter 16, as we read, during the time of the falling of the plagues. So it reaches its climax in the sixth plague, but it's something that has already been happening over a period of time. That's what this word is saying, sunago gain. It is that process that has been taking place of gathering people, gathering them to the battle of Armageddon. And so this word sunago gain, that's where we get the word synagogue, which means to, to gather, it also means to capture. It also means uh, to put people together. So that's the function, the chief function of these three unclean spirits. So they are putting people together, capturing people, uh, bundling them and pushing them <clears throat> forward, as it were, to the battle of Armageddon. And the question is, are they going to achieve? Are they going to achieve their agenda? Revelation chapter 13, verse 18 says, All who dwell on earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And so these spirits, as I speak right now, they are busy gathering people towards the battle of Armageddon. My brothers and sisters, I want you to understand that this is a global, <clears throat> we're talking about a global threefold movement seeking to take the whole world captive. We are living in the gathering time itself. The three evil spirits are three demonic avenues of deception which are meant to drag people 
to the battle of Armageddon. If you happen to escape the demonic influence of the dragon, surely the sea beast will not miss you. Peradventure, you escape the intoxicating wine of the sea beast. Then you will have to contend with the deceptive influence of the false prophet. The false prophet will get you. Ellen White calls this a confederation of evil. This is a threefold confederation of evil. Notice the characteristics of these three evil spirits. The first one, they are all unclean. In Revelation chapter 16, verse 13, these are unclean spirits, demonic spirits. Brothers and sisters, you need to understand that we live at a time when all hell has broken loose. All the demons, demons of every kind have been set loose by the devil in his final push to sit at the mount of the congregation at Armageddon. And so we, in our days, in our time, we need to understand that we are contenting with unclean spirits. And these unclean spirits don't respect churches. They don't respect organizations. They don't respect congregations. They have an agenda to make sure that Lucifer is worshipped. And so they invade the churches. They are unclean spirits. And so you need, as the church of God, to be aware. You need to guide yourself with the truth that is the word of God. You need to be able uh, to put on a discerning spirit, lest our pulpits are occupied by demons themselves, men and women full of unclean spirits. And so we need not slumber at this hour. Point number two, they are frog-like. They look like frogs. I will talk about that. Number three, they come out of the mouth. They come out of the mouth. The first one come, comes out of the mouth of the dragon. The other one comes out of the mouth of the beast. The third one comes out of the mouth of the false prophets. And so these spirits have a complex and subtle way of messaging their package. They, they, they operate with a strategy. It, it's not just a haphazard kind of movement. They know how to package their message in a very subtle way. Point number four, they specialize in miracles. Revelation chapter 16, verse 13. They specialize in miracles. And we are right away in the time when people are parading miracles, miracle crusade, miracle healing, miracle money, miracle, miracle. That's the chorus of our time. Point number five, these spirits are demonic in nature. They are demons. Number six, they lead their adherents to destruction. So these are the characteristics of the, the three spirits. The question is, why are these spirits like frogs? Why are not they? Why are not? Uh, why are they not uh, like bats or, or, you know, any other animal? Why are they likened to frogs? For us to understand this one, we need to consider uh, the great controversy in Egypt. It will help us the events in Egypt will help us to understand why the spirits are like frogs. You will remember <clears throat> that as Moses stood before Pharaoh, <clears throat> Moses and Aaron represented the kingdom of heaven. And Pharaoh himself, together with his uh, um, um, 
dignitaries who represented the kingdom of darkness. And, and, and so you, you witness the great controversy raging in Egypt. In order to demonstrate the power of God, Moses threw his rod on the ground in the presence of Pharaoh and it turned into a snake. We are told in Exodus chapter 7, verse 11 and 12, that Pharaoh also called his magicians and sorcerers. They also did the same thing with their enchantments. Their rods turned into snakes. As if that was not enough, Moses straight out his rod upon the Nile and the waters turned into blood. Exodus chapter 7, verse 22 says, the magicians also turned water into blood with their magic. In Exodus chapter 8, verse 6, the Bible says, and Aaron straight out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came out and covered the land of Egypt. You go to verse 7 of the same chapter. The Bible says, and the magicians. And the magicians of Pharaoh did so with their enchantments and brought out frogs upon the land of Egypt. And so it was 3-3 three, three now. 3-0. Three, oh. But you will notice that frogs were the last plaque that the devil could replicate. It was the last one. That was his final push in the great controversy in Egypt. His last trump card to challenge the power of God. And that explains why the demonic spirits that gather people to the battle of Armageddon are like frogs. Because this is the, the devil's last counter strategy against God in the great controversy. Why are these spirits like frogs? Point number two. We need to consider the characteristics of a frog. The characteristics of a frog would best describe the activities, the nature, the methodologies of these spirits. Frogs are cold blooded animals. They take the temperature of the environment. So these spirits have no problem adjusting to different, different situations and different environments. They fit well even in the church. They fit well everywhere outside the church. Frogs are amphibians. They have that ability to live, in, or to live on water and outside water, that is on land. This, the three unclean spirits also are uh, well adapted to stay uh, uh, in churches. They can invade churches. They can also lead millions astray outside the church. It is possible for church people to be possessed by the three frog-like spirits. They have no problem in adjusting to the temperatures. They have no problem in adjusting to the different environments. Point number three, they are unpredictable in movement, just like a frog, just like a frog, which is unpredictable in its movement. These spirits are also very unpredictable. They can do anything. Point number four, frogs are unclean animals. Thus, the frog-like spirits represent uncleanliness, represent all forms of uncleanliness, all forms of ungodliness and wickedness. Frogs attack their prey using their tongue. And that's exactly what these spirits do. They use their tongue, the mouth, the power of the tongue to deceive their prey to captivate their prey. They use the tongue. Frogs are noisy, very noisy. To compensate for the absence of the spirit of God, you will notice 
that people who are animated by these frog-like spirits major in making noise. Noisy worship services accompanied by wild music, a din of wild music, a lot of noise. This signifies the presence of these wicked spirits. Frogs swell up to amazing sizes when provoked. And so my brothers and sisters, do not underestimate the power of these three frog-like spirits. And the question is, why are they three? I want you to know that the devil knows that he's fighting against the God yet. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so he came up with his own counterfeit Godhead. And so in this counterfeit Godhead, the dragon is a counterfeit of the Father. The, the dragon represents the devil himself. He is a counterfeit of the Father. You will notice that in Revelation chapter 4, verse 2, the Father, God the Father, has a throne. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 2, the devil has a throne. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 10, God is worshipped. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 4, the dragon is also worshipped. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, God the Father gives power and authority of heaven and earth to Christ. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 4, the dragon gives power and authority to the sea beast. This is the very opposite of God the Father. So the devil himself in this an holy trinity in this unholy God, Godhead, so to say, the devil masquerades as God the Father. He counter, he counterfeits the work of God the Father. The beast counterfeits the work of God the Son. In Luke, in Revelation chapter, in Luke chapter 3, verse 21 to 23. Jesus himself, the second person of the Godhead, <clears throat> rises out of the water through the rite of baptism to begin his ministry. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 1, the sea beast comes out of the prophetic water. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, Christ receives power, authority from his father. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 2, the sea beast receives power authority from the dragon. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, Christ um, ministers for three and a half years, according to Daniel chapter, chapter, chapter 9, verse 26, Revelation chapter 13, verse 5. The sea beast ministers, as it were, for 42 prophetic months. 42 prophetic months. Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. You will notice that Christ is the lamb that was slain. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 3. The sea beast was slain, as it were. He received a fatal wound. Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. Christ rose from the dead. He rose from the dead. He conquered death. Glory be to God. But in Revelation chapter 13, verse 3, the beast that had a wound inflicted on it. John says, I saw the wound that it was healed. In other words, this beast experienced a resurrection. So whatever Christ did, this beast also would imitate. So the beast of Revelation chapter 13 is a counterfeit of God the Son. You will notice that God the Son forgives sin. This beast, the sea beast, also claims to forgive sin. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 3 to 4, and verse 18, <clears throat> you will notice that uh, Christ himself, <clears throat> Christ himself, <clears throat> uh, Revelation chapter 13, verse seven, <clears throat> you will notice that this 
sea beast was given power and authority over the whole earth. After the fatal wound had healed, he got the power now <clears throat> to embrace, as it were, the whole world and drag it towards worshiping the beast. Christ himself says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. So Christ is drawing all men to himself. The beast is also drawing all men to himself. And so my brothers and sisters, this is the great controversy. The false prophet, prophet is a counterfeit of God, the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 4, verse 30 and 31, the Holy Spirit performs great miracles. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 18, the false prophet also performs great signs and miracles. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes down as tongues of fire at Pentecost. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 18, the uh, false prophet brings down fire from heaven. So, so you can see that the false prophet is an antithesis of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> John chapter 16, verse 18 and 14, the Holy Spirit leads people to Christ. When he, the spirit of truth comes, he shall speak about me. He shall talk about me. Revelation chapter 13, verse 12, the false uh, prophet directs worship towards the sea beast. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, the Holy Spirit applies the seal of God on our foreheads. Revelation chapter 19, verse 20, the false prophet is instrumental in enforcing the mark of the beast. And so you see, my brothers and sisters, that we are in a great controversy. The Holy Spirit gives life, breath, breath of life. Romans chapter 8 verse 11. Now you will notice that the false prophet gives life or a breath to the sea beast. Revelation chapter 13 verse 15. The Holy Spirit is called the spirit of truth guiding people to salvation. John chapter 14 verse 26. John chapter 16 verse, verse 14. But the false prophet deceives people. He deceives people and leads them to perdition. In Revelation chapter 16, verse 18, and chapter 19, verse 20. That is what is happening here. And so, the dragon <clears throat> is masquerading as God the Father. The sea beast, which is purposely, is masquerading as God the Son. The false prophet it is also masquerading as God, the Holy Spirit. Now, we need to understand the frog that came out of the dragon. What is it all about? Revelation chapter 13, 16 verse 18 says, the first frog came out of the mouth of the dragon. The dragon is the devil himself. Revelation chapter 12 verse 9, we will do well. <clears throat> we will do well. To, to listen to what the dragon says about himself. He will tell us that which comes out of his mouth so we, that we may know his violence, so that we may know his schemes in the great controversy, especially in our time. In Genesis chapter three, verse four, you remember in Genesis chapter two, verse six and seven, 16 and 17, God says you may eat all the the, uh, the fruit trees in the Garden of Eden. But this one, this one, the tree of knowing good and evil, you shall not eat and you shall not touch. And the devil says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 4, you shall not surely die. In verse 17, God had said, you, the day you shall partake of this fruit, you shall surely die. And the devil says, you shall not surely die. That actually explains, as it were, it actually reveals the devil's manifesto. You shall not surely die. And because of this manifesto, my brothers and sisters, we have 
now experienced in our time, the spirit of spiritualism reigning, reigning and sweeping throughout the whole globe. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 5, the living know that they die, but the dead know nothing. The dead know nothing. Brothers and sisters, the spirit that is coming out of the dragon is spiritualism itself. Spiritualism is premised on the first satanic lie that says you shall not die. And this, is, this spirit has invaded public space. It has invaded even social media. It's there. People are hooked into spiritualism. They are hooked into satanism. Demons are impersonating our dead loved ones and masquerading like, you know, real people. And yet they are demons. And so we live at a time when spiritualism has um, engulfed the whole world. The frog that comes out of the beast is the purple system. The purple system is a union of states and the church. And it talks about, what is it all about? It's about the infallibility of church leaders. That's the spirit behind purpose, uh, purpose, infallibility of church leaders. That's the spirit. That's the spirit. When people now <clears throat> um, play God in their churches, human beings, mortal human beings, claim that they are gods, claim that they speak ex cathedra claim that you know they are infallible in precept and in works that's the spirit of purpose what is this spirit it is hedonism hidden under the false gab of christianity it is uh, you know tradition um tradition Tradition. That's what they believe, not the Bible. Tradition takes precedence in matters of faith. The Bible is relegated to just an ordinary book, one of the books, through higher criticism. And so when people embrace higher criticism, even in the remnant church already, they are filled with the spirit of purpose. This spirit also manifests itself in worldliness. And so you find worldliness matching, as it were, into the church. And that's the spirit of purpose. So my brothers and sisters, you can be in the remnant church and yet possessed with the spirit of purpose. It is possible. The frog that comes out of the false prophet is what we call the charismatic movement. The charismatic movement or the charismatic wave has its roots in apostate Protestantism, which began in the United States of America in 1889. And so we read even from history that this charismatic movement started just like, you know, any other, you know, um, movement small as it was, but then right now as we speak, it has taken the world like a storm. By 1967, practically all of the major historic denominations were uh, permeated and influenced by this new charismatic revival. And from its humble beginnings, the charismatic movement has made an impact on the church possibly unparalleled in history. My brothers and sisters, I want us to understand that we are living in the gathering time. This movement emphasizes miracles, miracle money, miracle pen, miracle exam, miracle water, miracle clothes, miracle fest miracle everything 
And that's the punchline. And you will notice that people are being gathered into cults ready for the battle of Armageddon. The most dangerous spirit is the spirit of the false prophets because it majors in bundling up people in cults. That's what it does. That's what it does, my brothers and sisters. Now, how can you escape these spirits? The work of the three unclean spirits. Is there any way of escaping from the onslaught coming from the devil, the dragon himself, from the beast, and from the false prophet? The good news, my brothers and sisters, tonight that I want to present to all of us is that God has made a way. Oh, yes, he makes a way where there is no way. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 says, And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on earth and to every nation, kindred and tongue and people, and saying in a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. Worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. The first angel's message, my brothers and sisters, the first angel's message opposes the work of the dragon. The first angel's message opposes even the spirit that comes out of the mouth of the dragon. The spirit that comes out of the mouth of the dragon gathers people to worship the dragon. The first angel's message says, worship God, the one who created heaven and earth and the springs of water. The second angel's message followed in verse 8 and said, Babylon is fallen. It is fallen. That great city, because she has made nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Revelation chapter 18, verse 4 tells us of the fourth angels, the angel that gives power to the proclamation of the second angel's message. And he says in a loud voice, come out of here, my people, that you may not be partakers of your sins, that you receive not their plagues. The second angel's message, my brothers and sisters, counteracts the work of the sea beast. The second angel's message is an antithesis to the work of the sea beast. Revelation chapter 14 verse 9 says, and the third angel followed and said, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture unto the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. The third angel's message is an antithesis to the work of the false prophet, because the false prophet is going to be the one who's going to be instrumental in making people receive the mark of the beast. And so the third angel's message opposes the work of the false prophet. How do we escape this great gathering? We can only escape it as we cling to the three angels' message. My brothers and sisters, I want, by the grace of God, to exhort the church of God to embrace the three angels' message. There is no way you can escape the three frog-like spirits if you fail to embrace the three angels' message. So as we live in this gathering time, there is no halfway house. There is no neutral ground, as it were. There is no neutral ground. It's either you are gathered by the three frog-like spirits, or you are going to be gathered, as it were, by the three angels' message. My brothers and sisters, the good news that is coming to us is found in Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. It says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Who is going to escape this great recruitment for, uh, force? Who is going to escape 
this great movement, demonic movement that is reigning supreme on planet Earth, that is blowing people and pushing them towards the battle of Armageddon. Who is going to escape? And the answer is clear in the Bible. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. May the Lord bless us. May the Lord extend his mercy upon us as we live in these last days. We pray that the Lord may help us to embrace the three angels' message. The three angels' message is the antidote to the reception of the mark of the beast. The three angels' message opposes the work of the three frog-like spirits. And as we embrace this message, the Lord is going to lead us from faith to faith, from glory to glory, and from victory to victory. I pray that that may be our experience. Shall we pray? Gracious eternal Father, I want to thank you for the message that you have brought to us this evening. I want to thank you for revealing, disclosing in a very clear way the devil's strategy plan for end times. I want to thank you, Father, for also introducing us to your strategy. And it is your strategy that works. And we want to thank you, O oh Father, for the plan of salvation. How much, O oh Father, our hearts yearn for you, especially at this hour. We cannot escape this great deception that is taking place on planet Earth without your aid. And so we commit our lives into your hands. Help us, O oh Father. Embrace us in your hands. We pray, O oh Lord Jesus, embrace us in your hands and lead us, lead us from faith to faith. Help us to be victorious Christians wherever we are. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.